Hey, what's going on, everybody? And welcome to Legacy's Journey, where we talk about creating what outlives you. I'm your host, Cameron Williams, owner of Kenley Consulting, where we focus on strategic financial growth for marketing agencies so that they can live the dream life they want to. And of course, we do that through CFO services. Now, I don't know if you can see it because of the fancy camera angle, but you know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta tap into your resources and make some phone calls to important people, okay? And so this person to my left is, I would consider pretty important. He's doing some very cool things in the marketing world. I call him the owner of the Chick-fil-A's of marketing. <laughs> so to my left, we have two time in a row, Inc. 5000 award winner, owner of the Height conglomerate, JC Height. What's up, brother? I'm so excited to be here. I'm happy to have you. So <laughs> let's jump into it because it's a ton of things we can get into. Uh, so first off, tell the people who you are, Yeah. how many years you've been in business, mm -hmm. and then we'll jump into it. And who you serve, of course. Yeah. I'm the uh, worst looking part oh, of the gosh. Heights, oh, gosh. Karen and I. Uh, my wife and I, <laughs> we reside in Nicaragua in Central America where we have a goal of bringing stability to a very unstable world. And uh, we're heavily involved in what it looks like to create you know, stable jobs for moms and dads. And digital marketing is simply the framework that we've focused on the last few years. And so five years, just under 200 employees. We have a uh, few offices in our franchise model across the United States, and we're just trying to grow and scale and serve. And, and then from that, we, we broke off and created an inner circle, right? And um, uh, it's been an incredible journey. God's been good to us, and uh, we're very, uh, again, not only you know externally, how do we bring stability to the world, but internally, how do we build a, br a business that supports our faith, supports our family, and allows us to you know, build a legacy and hopefully set our kids off on the right track. Important things. All right, cool. So, oh, you got to tell them who you serve specifically, though. Who do I serve specifically? Like, yeah. You, I, we know you're a marketing agency, but do yeah. you have like a particular industry or niche that you help? We don't. Um, I, mean, I got two customers, right? So one, I work with agency owners that want to become franchises or want to join our, our business, right? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. And then number two, uh, our, our, our end clients are, I mean, we have roofers, plumbers, accountants. We have uh, uh, the most craziest clients you can think of. Any business that wants to grow and scale through digital marketing, we, we serve them. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so... Let's jump into these questions. So now, you heard him talk about his wife. So they have an interesting story. We're not going to make him spill his guts. But when you said, so you've been in business, you said about five, going on six years now. Yeah. So five years ago, you're about to start this idea, maybe not the fully developed version that we know now. Yeah, yeah. But you said, hey, babe, I think we should start our own marketing company. Yeah. She looks at you and says, I'm what? an idiot. Oh, she's, oh, she was so pissed. The can I tell the story there a little bit of it? You can tell whatever you want. Yeah. So, so we actually worked with another large agency, and we had equity in that agency, mm -hmm. and uh, we were Inc. Five Thousand five years in a row. We were growing three hundred fifty employees, and it was beautiful from like a work angle. But at that moment, and I think a lot of things have changed over there since then. But uh, at that moment, drugs hookers, I mean, you name it. It was Wolf of Wall Street like nobody's business. I don't even it's know. It's like an HBO show. I mean, dude, Wolf of Wall Street had nothing on us. Oh, um, if you were on the sales team and you hit your goals, the best salesperson got strippers like every oh, week, we right? partying. It was nuts. Oh, wow. And as you know, Karen and I aren't of that world. Like, we just don't participate That's in that type of stuff. That is true. And so that is true. our mind at that moment was, oh, we're light and darkness. You know, we're here, people know who we're at, we're leaders in this organization, we, like, we're yeah. gonna try to help people and, and mm -hmm. you know, do all this stuff. And Karen and I were seven months pregnant with our first child. Shout out to the first child. Shout out to Olivia. And something switched in our minds, like overnight. And we were like, you know what? We're not missionaries in this, in this world. We're literally recruiting people into this. Like, I'm talking, five, 10 people a month into this environment and showing them that this is what success is. Oh. And immediately like came in our hearts that like, man, what if my daughter came here? I would be ashamed if my daughter knew the right. type of stuff that was going on here. I mean, walk into the bathrooms, cocaine, like you just sit on the desk, drugs on the desk. I mean, like it wasn't even hit. It sounds like a great HBO special. By and, the way. So, and so two months away from having our first child, 
I walked in the office and I left the organization. I exchanged my non-compete in exchange for my equity. So I lost, and I didn't have a lot of equity, but I lost all my equity in exchange for my non-compete, mm. which allowed me to go start my agency. Okay. So two months in, we both walked away. Fresh start. How are we going to pay the bills? We had a little bit of savings, but not a lot. How are we going to pay for our daughter to be born, you know, in two months? Yikes. And, you know, it's things, I, th- I have moments in life in my career when I look back and like, that was so stupid. Like, I would never advise someone to do this, but I think God blinds us in sometimes moment, to, like, yeah. he, he was blinding us. Because in the moment, we're like, yeah, this is the smartest thing to do. <laughs> Looking back, I'm like, Because I feel convicted. Yuck. I, I got to get up out of here. God's going to make a way. Yeah, yeah. And it ended up being, like, and so we just hired one person. It was never really, like, a, we want to grow something huge. It was, like, survival, you know? And so... Was this we, Gustavo the first hire? Gustavo was the first hire. Shout out to Gustavo. Gus is, uh, I mean, he's my brother from another mother. I remember him coming over for that first interview and the joke is it was in my bedroom. It was in the spare bedroom of my house, but it was in the bedroom of my house. <laughs> and he, he worked at that he worked at the previous company. Yeah. Again, I didn't they waived my non compete. And so he worked at the previous company. It was a five story building, lunches, like all this stuff, really cool. I mean, amazing. And he came over to work at height. We had nothing. He made a gamble and he believed in the mission and the vision. And I'll always have a, a huge place for Gus, you know, in my heart and because um, Gus is still here, by the way. Gus is still so, around, baby. He, he's and so, literally the day one definition. That's right. That's right. And so, um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of how we started, and it's been a blessing ever since. All right, cool, cool. So now that's immediate. So now we have the baby. We start getting some momentum and getting yeah. clients. Are we in Nicaragua at this point, or are we in the we're, U.S.? We're in Nicaragua the whole time, yeah. In fact, okay. the old agency was in Nicaragua as well. Okay. Yeah. So now it's, let's go two years in. So this will be three years ago. Yeah, so yeah. what is that, 20, that's right around COVID. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So how does, take. so we're looking good. We're getting proof of concept. Yeah. Things are starting to look up. Yep. COVID hits. Mm-hmm. What happens? Oh, my gosh. So at this point, so we were growing really well. We were in the white label space, okay. and we were growing fast. We didn't, I didn't, I was the sales team, 100%. I mean, by like yourself. We, we got a, I, th- I want to say maybe like $2 million in revenue, and literally, there was no marketing department, and I was the only salesperson. This Every, is within two years you within, got the two million? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're five years now. We're just under 10 in the whole company altogether. And so within two years, we were right at two million. Maybe a little bit. I don't remember the numbers exactly I mean, for the call, but it was two close. Two million in two years sounds... Because we had about, I think we had 60 employees Okay. when we went remote. Right when COVID hit, and I, you know, like everyone else, it was like, "Hey, we're gonna go for a week," and then it just turned into whatever. But like, um, if you do the right things in business, um, if you do the right things in business, you you got to prepare for disasters, right? And that so, uh, love or hate Dave Ramsey, I did a lot of work with him growing up, and uh, and we kind of had this methodology. We didn't have debt in the company. We had all of our contracts were month to month, which gave us a lot of power in negotiation. Yeah. Um, we didn't have a lot of overhead. We kept it tight. We kept it lean. And so when COVID hit, everyone went remote. You know, we were thinking a week or day like everyone else. And um, we went in the negative. Obviously, that first month, 30% churn, another 30% churn. You know, I mean, huge. So we're losing, what, 50% of our, our portfolio over the course of – Yikes you know, over the course of two months. And so we went in the negative like 30,000. I think two months later, uh, we were back in the positive, which actually gave us leverage. So when you go through these disasters, money doesn't disappear in the world. Right. It just shifts. Correct. Right? And so, so how do you get in a position of power in these detriments? So actually during COVID, so let's think the year, we went from 60 employees to 100 employees during that year. You just, well, well, we went from files. 60 team members mm-hmm. to right at 100 team members. Even though you just had From year two to year three. We gained point. it back. So within two months, we were back in the positive. And what, there's not a lot of agencies in the positive. So what were we doing? We were going out and recruiting talent that was getting let go. We were going and like, uh, acquiring clients oh. that the agencies were shutting down. We were going out and hustling. And so right now, we're about to go through this. I mean, we're, something's coming right now. I mean, you may be positive and idea, but like something is about to shift in the world. And we're doing the same thing right now. How can we get to a position of strength? Right now, you've got... If I had to guess, you've got 50,000, I don't know, 20,000 P 
people in the marketing space all wanting to retire. And in their minds, they're going, do I want to go through this next recession? Do I really want to do that? No, I really like to just get rid of this thing. And so the opportunity to buy agencies are going to be really cheap, I think, over the next six months. They're not going to even be profitable hardly. And so you'll be able to buy portfolios at very little cost. There's going to be a lot of opportunities. That sounds very similar to kind of how the accounting industry is because a lot of these guys are your 60 to 70-year-olds. Yeah. Had these firms for yeah. 30 years, and they're like, you know, yeah. do I really want to yeah. keep doing this? So COVID, for me, that strategy and, and working through all those numbers in the playbook is exactly what I'm even doing right now. So it's fresh on my mind of mm. the ideas and strategies. I'm thinking team members, which in the last five months, we or last five, in the last 60 days, we've brought on some really heavy team members already. Nice. I mean, you got people that have been at Amazon and Google and Facebook for years getting laid off. I mean, what an opportunity. So when you're talking opportunity, you're looking at these people as, wow, this is an undervalued asset that I can now go get, put them in our system frameworks and processes and become even better. A hundred percent. So it's the time to get team members and it's the time to get clients, but client acquisition um, for me, I mean, I am working on new sales, just going out and get client by client, right? Obviously. Right. But the bigger opportunity in client acquisition is going after agencies that want to sell, want to exit, that are not profitable, wanting to retire, whatever the reason. I mean, you can add, you can add a million dollars, two or $3 million to your portfolio like this. Now, okay, let's go there. Because some people will say, well, if they're not a profitable agency, why would you focus on trying to acquire them? I know the answer, but... To keep it clear. Well, if another agency, that other agency has all of these expenses that are making them not profitable. Well, if I acquire them and I'm getting that revenue, I don't need an accounting person. I already have that. So that expense is cut. I don't need that head of sales because I already have that. So that expense is cut. I don't need that sales force because we already have our CRM. That, that's the expense. So you start cutting 20 or 30. So when I'm looking specifically for agencies, ideally they're in the 5 to 10% profit margin. Right? Which is not a lot. Which isn't a lot, but it's actually above average. <laughs> most, most businesses in the world do not profit what you think they profit. They just don't. I've been learning that because I'm like, hey, JC, blah, blah, blah. He's like, yeah, that's not really how that works. But I see where you're coming from. And I'm like, ah. It's, so. they're, they're just not, right? Like, I mean, think of, the, think of the percentage of people that don't even hire accountants. It's huge. It right, is, and, and we can make large. the assumption that people that don't hire accounting firms are probably the ones that are smaller than those the ones that do. Correct. Right? I'm profitable. What do I do with this money? Well, let me hire a CFO and let me run, go from there. Right. The ones that aren't profitable don't hire CFOs. They can't afford it. Correct. Right. They're not even thinking that route, and so, uh, <laughs> and that's a big majority of the space. Yeah. And so we're looking for agencies. Like our franchises can have anywhere from 25 to 40 percent profit margins, right? Or, or anywhere is, there. Let's pause. We want you to know that as an agency, your normal profit margin is 20 to 25 percent if you're doing it right. That's if you're if you're under a million dollars. If Correct. once you get above that, those margins start shrinking. You know, um, uh, at scale, an agency can be you know. Well, anyway, we're looking for ones that are five to 10 percent, and then how can I overnight make them 20 to 25 percent? So part of that is cross-sells. So I take an agency that's only doing pay-per-click, and I immediately offer for every single client SEO. If 20% say yes to that, I can increase the, the entire you know, right. revenue by almost 50%. Correct. Right? Because SEO is a lot more expensive than I'm mm -hmm. charging for the PPC. So like, there's so many ways once you have those clients. Now, wait. So we got to pause and make sure that y'all are keeping up because, as you can see, dropping a ton of gems here. So essentially, because he already has his systems in order, he already has a team in place, he already has his strategies and processes, him acquiring somebody for him is almost, almost an automatic win because, yeah, they may have only be profitable by 10%, but he already has the structure and the infrastructure and the team in place to be able to come in and immediately make super small changes to him but probably huge changes to that old agency's portfolio yeah. that automatically skyrockets their results. Mm -hmm. So I think that really hones in on the importance of, like some people are like, ah, oh, well, I'll just keep it all in my head. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I'll just keep a little running Excel list. Like, mm -hmm. no, this is somebody who has systems, a team, processes, has long-term goals, short-term goals. So it's plug into my system. 
that I already have efficient. And then you can automatically start making, in his case, a ton mm -hmm. of money, not because, oh, we're the best thing in the world, but, but simply because we're the most efficient and we have our process locked in. So I think that's something very important to hone in on because mm -hmm. a lot of people think, oh, well, he just, you know, maybe he's just smarter. He's just creative mm -hmm. or he's lucky or he's mm -hmm. just winging it when in your case it's mm -hmm. like, no. And well, in, in order to get to that point, which I think is important, is is how we grew height. Okay, and and I think this is actually a really big thing where a lot of us in all businesses mess up. Mm -hmm. So so normally, I kind of have a rule that someone has to be the expert. It's, Somebody. It, it sounds like a very simple rule, but we don't live by it. So what do we do? A lot of agency owners out there, a lot of businesses out there, are like man, I I'm I'm not good at sales. I don't like that. So what am I going to do? Well, let me go hire a salesperson. Right. Which so, is logical. It's logical. It makes sense. So because I don't, I'm, so I'm not the expert is what I'm saying. So I need to go hire someone. But, Correct. But who do they go hire? Well, they go hire a VA. They go hire someone that needs a job that hasn't been able to keep a job. They go hire someone that's the cheapest person on the market. Right. So is that person the expert? Probably not. not. And so at height, we made a lot of sacrifices in the beginning to go, okay, I'm not an expert in PPC. So that means that whenever I hire someone, I need to make sure that they are an expert. Right. Meaning that I wasn't recruiting people that didn't have jobs. What I was doing is I was going to other pay-per-click agencies. And who's been there? Three, four, five. Gus was there for five years when I brought him over. The next mm -hmm. person I hired was mm -hmm. there for three years when I brought them over. So now I know. That you're good. I know that they got to be good. Right? Because you've been there for X amount of years. If, if I can't, if I don't know that I'm hiring an expert, it's actually better for me to just figure it out. Why? Because I, because I know exactly what I'm doing. And I know exactly where I'm failing. I know exactly the processes. So where people mess up is they'll hire someone and they're like, I think this guy will be good. I don't know, but I think he will be. And then they hire them. They do a little bit of training, a little bit of onboarding. And that person kind of goes and does their thing. Whoa. And so, and so we don't even I'm know. Like we don't even know like how to coach them. We don't know how to mentor them. We don't even know what KPIs should be on them. We don't even know how to, how to manage them mm -hmm. because we don't even know how to do it. Right. And so, so for us, our philosophy was, and the reason we were so attentive to detail is that we hired all these people. I bet our first 40 people that we brought on to height, and I'm guessing here, but I would say our first 40 people that we brought on to height had an average experience specifically in their role of two to three years before we brought them on. That's that a was huge advantage. Of course. It was a huge advantage. I didn't have a training department until we hired maybe 50 or 60 people because I didn't need it. And some people would probably, and I think what you're hinting at without just coming out and saying it is a lot of times we get things that we think we need when we really don't. And I, I'm saying this combining a lot of our conversations, mm -hmm. but like in that case, oh, well, you need a training department. Why would he need one when I'm hiring super qualified people that have already been killing yeah. it at their past opportunities? Yeah. There's not much training other than this is our system and this is how mm -hmm. I want to do it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, there's a, the, the, it boils down to the idea that the more experience you can have, the better. Now, what people do is we're a little lazy when it comes to recruiting. Uh -oh. We're a little lazy. And so what we do is we put out a job offer. One person applies. We interview them. If they're halfway decent, if they just make a smile, if they whatever, we hire them. Emotional. It just, it, you just It's quick. It's, I need someone. Let me go hire someone. Mm -hmm. Versus like real like. If you bring on the right people and really pay attention and really dig into that process. And so we have a, we have a very robust, and from day one, we've got a very robust, you know, um, process to get recruited on at height. Especially the video. <laughs> the video of awesomeness, right? And so, like, we have these different things to make sure that we're bringing, the ideas that we want to bring on as much experience into height as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Now... In today's world, we're doing some training from the ground up. We're hiring, you know, attitude, thought process, what they did right. in college, and we'll train them up. But that's because now we have all those processes. We have all of those specific systems. We have all that knowledge that's executed into Salesforce and so on and so forth. In other words, don't start doing stuff that you don't need too early. Yeah. All right. Now, let's, let's go a little bit more into the personal side. So, yeah. of course... Been happily married for how long? 10 years this month, actually. Oh. 10 years on the 17th. So it's like, oh man. I don't know when this podcast is dropping, but around here. Yeah. Are you going to, what's that? Can we say what the anniversary surprise is going to be for 10 years? Brother, it's, it's uh, one thing I've learned is that uh, you don't want to set the expectation too high. So I'm not going to do anything so, or else. No. no I'm um, 
Yeah, I, I need to think about that. It's okay. I hadn't even thought about it. We're guys, and we're gonna with figure you. it out anyway. My assistant, my assistant is on maternity leave for three months. My life is a little bit unplanned right now, to be oh, honest man. with you. <laughs> Oh, that sounds man. terrible, but shout out to CB. Yeah, it is what it is. All right, so let's go there. So as you can see, and mind you, by the way, he only told you like a little sliver. There's height, the company. Then there's some of these other amazing ideas <laughs> that all fold into. I call it the conglomerate. You know, make it sound super serious. But how do you balance? All of that, because I mean, when we really look at it and break it down, you're talking yeah. four or five different businesses, give or take. Yeah. How do you balance that with family time? Because at this point, we have kid number two. Yeah. You know, the baby is now five, going on six. Yeah. So what does that look like to not be dad, you're always working? Mm -hmm. And even with the wife, like, man, we just work, 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 work. That's our yeah. relationship. What does that balance look like for you on a weekly basis? A couple of very simple rules. Uh the, number, the first rule is when do you turn it off? And I turn it off regardless. I don't care if the world's burning down. I try to turn it off. And so my Karen and I's rule is at 4 o'clock, computer phones are off, right? And so... Wait, whoa, poop. So at 4... At 4 o'clock. That's it. Monday through Friday, we're done. So if the Rare needs, exceptions. Rare except Not TV's on because we'll do that as a family or whatever. No, but I'm like, saying if the team needs you... They'll figure it out. Or they won't. Until tomorrow when you come in. Look, there's nothing, nothing's going to die. And so Karen does leave on her phone. If someone calls her, they can get to me, but it just doesn't happen. So, so this is rule number one, mm -hmm. right? Now, and again, nothing is going to, like nothing is going to happen. It just doesn't, doesn't exist, right? Well, if things come up that could use your attention, yeah. But all that attention could be drawn the next day or the next day or the next day, whatever, right? So, and then rule number two is that you see today that we've got seven companies, mm -hmm. but we have, we were incredibly focused on height for, I mean, four years, nothing else, only height, period, like end of discussion, 100%. Right. I was with my leaders at height. So I've got Yasser, who's our head of product, uh, one of our VPs. Yasser. Uh, Galliano's incredible. He was with me for, he just had his fifth year anniversary. So he was with me three years. Uh, Agostina was, she just Goose. had her fifth year anniversary. Uh, no, Maria Agostina, actually our COO. Oh. So she was with me for, for, for three and a half years before, you know, I handed off those reins. So you, you've got all of these leaders throughout our organization that mm -hmm. I were hand and foot, I mean like hand and hand with for years before I like, okay, let me, you guys got this. Let me, let me turn a little bit of my attention the other right. way. Right. Which and, is smart. And so, well, I think, I think we'll see. Ask me in 10 years if it was smart, but it's smart. And so this is where people mess up. They're, they're, they're before they hire, or they, someone has to own it. Mm -hmm. Someone has to own it. Extreme responsibility. Extreme ownership. Yeah. Extreme, extreme responsibility. And so if, if someone doesn't own it, if you're the person who owns it and everything leads to you and then you're being distracted by other things, that's, that's tough. Mm. That's really tough. And so it's, especially if you want the company to keep growing, you're going to see slowly a decline. It may plateau for a little bit, but it will start declining without a, without a leader. I mean, that's biblical. Without a leader, it's, it's, it's really, happening. really tough. And so, so I worked for years to make sure my leaders and I are very, very aligned and w working hand and foot together. We're, we are. Um, and then I started creeping over. And then my wife actually runs a lot of our companies as well. So Shout out to Karen. Karen. And so um, I am very, very involved, you know, um, in all aspects of the business. And I stay involved with a very strategic, you know, plan. So, like, in fact, even to this day um, – Every VP at height, I meet with 30 minutes every week, like one-on-one. -on -one. Every manager, excuse me, every director at height, so I've got 15 directors at height, we meet every other week, one-on-one -on -one for 30 minutes. So I'm always in tune with what my leaders are working on within the organization. And of course, we have leadership meetings on the franchise side, leadership on the, um, I think I'm still, I'm still involved in all the, the company leadership meeting that we have once a week, all the company franchise leadership meeting we have once a week. And then as well as uh, we have a big focus right now on releasing a new um, uh, uh, team member playbook, essentially is what it is. And so I have, I have weekly meetings on that as well. And, but the day-to-day -day is handled by so a lot of our leaders. So therefore, when it's four, it's over. Yeah, when it's four, I'm, I'm, I'm done. You know? and, and that's been pretty consistent 
for, for, forever now. Now I start early, I start at seven every day. I don't take a lunch. My deal well, is how like, do you eat? Uh, my lunch is brought to me at the desk, and I eat during a meeting or during a session or whatever. And so my deal is my family's not at home during lunch, so why would I go take a lunch somewhere? You know, like, let's just keep working. So what is that? You know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 9 hours. So I'm working 45 hours a week, like, I mean, nonstop. That's plenty of time. Plenty of time. All right, so that's one. Cut off at four. Anything else that you do to – Try to continue to honor the, the kids and the wife? Yeah, so, you know, my I was raised in a way that wife is number one, kids are number two, or God's one, wife two, whatever kids it. do. And um, and so now we live at the beach, so it's a little different. We're, we're always, like, it's just us, you know? We're not out with friends or anything like that. And so uh, for years, um, we have date night every Friday night. I okay. mean, very, okay. very, very, very religiously. Uh, date night every Friday night. Mm -hmm. And so that's always, you know, really, really good. Um, and then we have a Bible study every night as a family, the four of us in, in Karen and I's oh, bed. Right. And so uh, I, I like um, I like rhythms. Yes. Every Friday night's date night. Every night at this time is Bible study. Every, you know, like the more rhythms I can get in, if I'm not in a habit, then it's really hard for me to to do it. Karen and I also go to the gym every morning together at 4.30, so 4.30 to, to 6. We're See, and I set my alarm this morning for 5, there and I go. was like... You didn't get up. He's our, no, I was up. Yeah? I didn't text you because I was like, crap, I think he's at 4.30. You should have texted me because actually I, I, we went late today because you guys exhausted us yesterday, but uh, that's all right. I will have to find a way to make it. All right, cool. So those are ways to keep in balance now. When you don't do those in the rare times, what does that look like? Because I know, like you said, as being a person of rhythms or structure, yeah. when those don't happen, is there guilt? Is there shame still? Or? No, you know, I mean, look, I would, it's interesting, right? Like, we are, um, I mean, we work together. We, we work out of the same house together. We you know, together dinner every night. We we were eating breakfast together. We're at the gym. We're we're together more than we're not. Most couples, you know, right. are by far right. So there's not a lot of guilt. Um, we have a very like uh, probably most people would think weird relationship, but it's very like you know just intimate, always together. We really like we're we're best friends, you know, type of thing. And so they really are because you should hear them with these jokes, and these <laughs> competitions. It is. It and so, uh, yeah, so we don't, you know, if we, if we get off one week or miss, then we, we'll make it up typically. Like, hey, let's move this to Tuesday or let's move this to Wednesday or whatever nice. the case may be. And so probably our biggest guilt is that we really try to be involved with our kids. So when we're on date nights, a lot of times we feel guilty of like, oh, the kids are at home with the nanny. Yeah, they don't ah. get to eat this. But we just are kind of really like, you know, every mentor and leader we've always heard from is that. The, the, the husband-wife relationship is number one, and so we trust that that will long tail be, uh, be work out. All right, so let's go back to your cutoff time. So I'll just speak for myself and be honest. So when you – what did it take for you to get to the point to be – I know it's one thing to be like, ah, I'm going to cut off at four. They got it. But I know at least for me, I'm like, yeah, but, oh, I got this idea, and I could be working on this, and, oh, man, I could have done this. How – how did you train, uh, maybe maybe ask, yourself to, like, hey? Yeah, it's not a training deal. It's not anything like that. It's just you make the decision. and But uh, you still get ideas. I mean, you said you got seven companies. I know there has to be, like, oh, man, yeah. we got to add this. Hey, what do you think about yeah. doing this idea? Yeah, it doesn't get easier, right? Uh -oh. um, but it's a decision. I mean, it, it's, like, it's like I want to get healthy. Okay, Make the decision to go to the gym every day. Well, what should I do? Well, it doesn't matter. Walk. I don't care. Just sit there. But just go to the gym every day, and you'll be a big step forward in the process, right? And so for me, it's make the decision. Oh, but I, but, hey, can. Yeah, you can. You'll figure it out. Trust me. The, I, one of my professors in college had this experiment they did for 10 years, mm -hmm. and I was on the tail end of it, so I got to see, like, the finale of it. And it was a, um, like, a capstone project where it was an entrepreneurial class, and you had the entire semester to build out this business plan, 
Okay. And Ami was like, "Is this where a hike started?" No, no, no. Oh. I can't even remember what our what our deal was. I can't remember it was something to do with coffee. But you you had the entire semester to build out this entire business plan. So like the marketing plan, the financial plan. I mean, like everything, 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 boom. And first day of class, the professor would, "Hey, here's the here's the project." And you take the whole semester, you build it out, you work on it. It was a huge deal, right? And turn it in. And he did this, and every other year he would switch it up. So the next year. He would only give the people three weeks to do the project. So an entire semester and three weeks. So you'd give them everybody, you got three weeks to do it, same assignment, same project, same requirements, same everything, but only three weeks. And what he discovered was, is that there was no difference in the quality of work turned in. We have this, in our, in our minds, we have this like weird, um, we, we, we think about time in a very weird manner. Mm -hmm. And if I tell you like, um, hey, we're going to do the podcast in seven weeks and just make sure you're ready for it. Like, okay, well, I got seven weeks to get ready, you know? But if I say 30 minutes, like, I mean, you, you just, you still get it done. You still make it happen. And, and even if you do it 90% or 95%, it's still going to be way better because all of this energy and time you save. And so for us, it's just, we're done by four, period. Mm. That's it. It's off. And I'll cancel meetings. I'll, I'll like if someone will book me. Like I'll, I'll like if it stinks on my calendar somehow, where an employee has access, and they'll book. Me, I cancel it. Mm. In a rare occasion, if it's personal, that's different, right? If you have a personal thing you need to talk to me about, and a team member, right? Like I'm, I'm always available for that. But yeah. So all these ideas that you get for oh hey for committed. Oh, yeah. I need to probably, you just write it down and you just keep on going. Yeah, or I'll tell, like every once in a while I'll cheat and I'll say, hey, Karen, Karen, message Cameron and tell him this, 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 right? So I'm not to doing it, she's doing it. come back to Nicaragua. Yeah. And so, look, the reality is, is your number one teammate is your spouse. Whoa. Like by far, bro. Your number one teammate is not your spouse. Not this, not Goose, not Claudia. No. God, Goose may quit on me next month. I don't know. I hope not. I hope she never does. We but love Goose, like my way. wife can't, or at least we believe that. Right. And so, so no one knows me better. No one understands me more. No one can help me more. No one can uh, help me make decisions better. No mm -hmm. one can. And so, like she is the head of my board of advisors. Is her. And so, what? <laughs> what better relationship to make sure that's like? I mean, you would, man. My CFO, man. I need to have these. I need to have a plan. I need to make sure we're communicating, make sure we're on right. top. You gotta have the same exact idea and even way more so with your spouse. Even if she's not in the company, it's still the same exact thing. Like when you have a really crappy day and I mean, work sucks, which being an entrepreneur, there are a lot of those days. Facts. Like when you go home, you gotta be able to calm back down. You gotta be able to come back down to earth. You gotta be able to chill. You gotta have someone when you're pissed off and you just wanna fire someone that says, hey, Let's really think this through. You got to have someone when you're, you know, and so you got to have that balance in your life. And if, if that, if that relationship, if your relationship with your CFO is not good, that's not good. If your relationship with your head of product isn't good, that's not good. You know, right. So on and so forth. Okay. That was, I hope y'all caught that. This is from two time of the year in 5,000 award winner. That just told you. Hit me up in a couple months. It'll be three. So three? you have to be three years in business to be eligible. And so we have five years, we have two years. So we're, we're going to be on it in a while. Don't I limit just, me just by saying two years. It's like well, two right. and ongoing. And ongoing. But I think it's super important to drill home that fact that as busy as you are, as successful, I would, he's super humble, I'm going to say it. As successful as he is, <laughs> he's still focusing on, hey, family first, which will always bring me the right success, putting the right people in the right places. So... Let's get into a little, this is probably going to be your fun, challenging section, so I'm giving you the heads up there. Let's talk about lessons. So, you've been doing this five years, you've seen the HBO special version, you've built something completely opposite. What are two or three things that you would say contribute to your success as a business owner? These can be daily habits. Um, things that you found, if I don't do these, my day seems a little bit more crappy. What would those two or three things be? I mean, there's definitely my personal habits that probably help out, right? Like I get up in the morning, I read my Bible every morning, I go to the gym every morning, I like do these specific things that get me started. But in, in terms of business, um, the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. 
And as a business leader, especially a young business leader, especially as an inexperienced business leader, you're going to screw it up a lot. And I mean, a lot of times you don't know what to do. You're making decisions based on ideas, based on dreams, based on a lot of like, you're not basing it on experience. And so, um, so Karen and I, God, I think gifted us with this ability. Like we genuinely love people. Like we will make sacrifices personally for our people. If you call me at night, I'm there. If you need me to come, like I'm there. I've been, I don't know how many employees that they have babies. I'm at the hospital meeting the baby and the child, you know, like we try to have that type of intimate relationship with our team members. We, we have things where, you know, a kid is sick. So we go by the hospital and make sure the bill is paid. We like, we just try to like find ways to just treat our people the same way we would want to be treated as much as humanly possible. And what that does is that it does a lot of different things. Um, it makes it when, you know, maybe we can't afford to pay a team member a lot more money, you know, and someone else is recruiting them. It makes them really think twice and maybe I want to stay around because I, these people really care about my future and who they are. It, yeah. it makes it where, you know, when I screw up and I make the wrong decision that we have people that care. It makes it when the culture, you know, we've had some toxicity in our culture due to a couple of uh, franchises actually. Mm -hmm. And, and that stuff bleeds in. And luckily you have leaders in the organization that you've loved on. It's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's not true. That there's more to that than, than, than what they're saying. And so, and so for us, it's, it's really, now that's shifted over the years and how we do that mm -hmm. uh, and what that looks like. Um, you know, newer team members, I just don't have the opportunity to have that relationship with. It's, it's my manager's responsibility to build that relationship. Right. And, um, and so Karen and I have uh, really about 20 or 30 people within the organization that we intentionally try to make sure that we are investing into the relationship not into the job, not into the position, not into their education, but like the relationship itself. Smart. And so we have a spare bedroom at our beach house. Like we bring people all the time. We're constantly trying to invite them and engage. We make sure they're at all of our kids' birthday parties. And, you know, we're at their kids' birthday parties. We make sure, you know, like we're investing in the relationship as much as possible. And so as a, as a young business owner, uh, a lot of times we are, um, and even to this day, Karen, and I, I, I'm not the highest paid person in the company. I think I have five employees right now that their literal paycheck is more than me. And I'm not being facetious about that in the sense that like, oh, my paycheck's smaller, but then I take dividends. No, like the complete amount of money that I take on an, on an annualized basis is less than my top five employees, right? And so why? Because I'm already incentivized. I'm not going to pay myself more and like, okay, I'm going to work harder, right? But my family's, dude, I've got some key people in this organization that are um, make your life easier that are crucial man yeah. that that have um yeah and so um we've been just really blessed by a committed team that that have um hopefully felt the love and hopefully are working at a p place or from a place where um they love what we're doing and what we're about and where we're headed okay okay if you could go back to high school or college version JC, you would tell him what? <sighs> ah, there we go. <laughs> um, it's a lot harder than what you think. Number one, like, okay. I mean, it's a lot harder. Like, entrepreneurship, I believe if you do it right, is really hard. And it's hard not only fundamentally, right. but a lot of people depend on you. We got 200 families that are fed because of height. If Which I make a stupid insane. decision and we go under, we get fed. Like, that's 200 families are going to be trying to figure out like, what do I do next? Right. It's a big responsibility. So number one is like that responsibility. Um, number two is that, and I'll, I'll give you three, okay. but number two is that um, um, a lot of th things are just not as they seem. They're just not as they seem. I'll okay. give you an example right here on the podcast. You okay. mentioned Inc. 5000 list. Yes. Fastest growing companies in the United States. By America. the way, and then in the top 1,000 of said list. Two years in a row. Fast. In the top 1,000. Look this is up. incredible. Check my man track record. But it's not always as it seems. Okay. So do you know the formula of the Inc. 5000? No. It's based on a three-year percentage of growth. Mm -hmm. So let me give an example. And you have to have a minimum of 100000 from what year one. So you're comparing year one to year three. Okay. Okay? 
And so, or year two to year four or whatever the case may be. So if you made a hundred thousand dollars in year one okay, and a million dollars in year three, mm -hmm. that's a thousand uh, percent growth. Yes. If I went from 5 million all the way to 10 million, which is $4 million in growth, mm -hmm. that's only 500% growth. So that first company would actually be above the second company. So, so, so it's actually really easy to get on the list in the first couple of years. In fact, you could be on that list and only grow like 50%. You could go literally from 100,000 to 300,000 in revenue and probably be on the list. You know what I'm saying? In fact, you're better off by growing a little bit. Why? Because it gets harder and harder. So the, the real truth of the Inc. 5000 list is those that have been on it 10 years. Because by nature of that, they would have had to go from 100,000, that's the minimum from the first one, mm -hmm. all the way up to whatever. But then they would have to take that number and grow from there, and then that number and grow from there, and so on and so forth. So after so many years, it becomes more and more. You can't grow a, you can't grow 800% every single 50 year. years in a row. Right. You know what I'm saying? But you can definitely do it in one year. And so everything is not as it seems. Like you see all these people online. Like I know one guy I followed forever and, uh, and even had him come speak at my event. And I still love, like he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. And he's a leader in the marketing industry and he teaches and he coaches and he mentors and all this type of stuff. And then he was like, GC, I want to sell my agency. So I was like, dude, yeah, I would love to. And so we sign NDA and I get into those books and Dude is doing less than a million in revenue. He was a third of the size of me. And here I was, I thought he was like triple or quadruple ours, right? Right. And so nothing is as it seems. You see people that are fancy and doing all these things and they're not profitable. You may see, and maybe it's true, but maybe it's not. And so in the world that we live in, a lot of us are looking at what we believe to be true and we're making decisions in our own business based on what we believe to be true. Yeah. We see that social media, the Instagram, the TikTok, the guy. The and highlight like, reel. Yeah, we see the highlight reel, and he's saying, do this and this. You're like, man, I got to do it if I want that highlight reel. But what we don't see is what's underneath that. Yeah. We, we see, wow, it's a beautiful car. It's clean. It's slick. It's shiny. It's even got the BMW logo on it. But then when you open the hood, there's no engine. There's no brakes. There's no pedals. There's no display. seats in the car. It just looks good. And you're making business decisions based on these things. Yes. And so my wife and I are really intentional about who we're learning from and really mm. trying to dig into, are they legitimate in what they're talking about? Are they legitimate in, in, in their real, real knowledge? Right? Mm. And so how do we go after that? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I had a third one, but I went too much into this one. So I'm, I'm I mean, who I'm you're learning trying to from, remember. I think, is super important because... To your point, like, and me and Ari were just talking about this last night. I'm like, it's so interesting. Like, if I ask one of my mentors, and we can say this because this is my show. My mom told me, hey, when you get mentors, you need two. One of them needs to look like you and the other one doesn't because they're going to give you two completely different mm -hmm. perspectives that you won't know about. Yeah. So it's always funny how I can take I, – I literally do this on purpose. I take the same problem and say, hey, mentor one that does not look like me. This is the problem. How would you handle it? Mm -hmm. I go to mentor two who does look like me. Same mm -hmm. question. And yeah. it's never the same. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. So then I'm like, okay, what position are they speaking from? Then now yeah. I've been blessed. Thank you, Lord Jesus, to have coaches and accountability group, which you just can't see because they're not on the camera. Yeah. And you take that same problem to them. They're not even going to speak on it because they're like, that's not my area. Mm -hmm. Then you can come to somebody like you who's not necessarily a coach, but just from overall business experience and character, we're yeah. very similar. And you're like, mm, yeah. I see how you got, like we literally did this yesterday. Cameron, I see how you got there, but I want to challenge your perspective to mm -hmm. approach it from way over here. Yeah, yeah. And how would that change your response? I heard a psychologist one time, a psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever, people that help people with marriages. And he gave actually the advice to the husband and wife. He said, if you really, if you truly want to have a great marriage, he said that you need to find uh, mentors, as you just said, that disagree with you. He said, so what's going to happen in your marriage is the woman is going to get pissed off at the wife. And who is she going to text? Her best friends. The woman that got her back like nothing else. And she goes, Laura, you wouldn't believe what just happened. Bop it, bop it, bop it. Cameron did this. And she's like, you know, girl, that's terrible. I mean, they're going to support you. Right. And that's why you text them. 
But if you if you find three or four people that you that wouldn't have your back by nature, you're gonna you're gonna get real stuff, yeah. right? And so I, I've been very very blessed to have mentors that have been there, that have done it, that have broken companies, that have succeeded in companies, mm-hmm. and uh, and that have the tangible data. I'll give you a secret. Secret. A secret. Like just a little pro tip. Uh, if you're if you're in the agency space or your accounting space or whatever, and you you believe someone's big, but you're just not quite sure, go to LinkedIn. So you so go to LinkedIn. So okay. here's what you do. Okay. You see that agency, you're like, man, dang, they are huge. They've got to be big, man. They they got all these like ABC, NBC, and they got all this like they're, they're a thousand followers or a million or whatever. Go to LinkedIn. Go to their company. So they work for Height Digital. Click on Height Digital and see how many people work for them. Because they're not a billion dollar firm if they got two employees. I mean, that's facts. They're not a huge accounting firm if they got one, right? That's facts. Now, maybe you don't want a huge one. You want someone more boutique, more hands on, more like, that's great, awesome. But just understand that. So if you go to Height and you see like they have 200 team members, I can't fake that junk. You know what right, I mean? Like, you legit like that's legitimate. Have them on paper. If I have 200 em- employees, I, I mean, there's got to be a. There's got to be a handful of clients in there somewhere, right? Facts. And so, so if you go to LinkedIn, it's just a lot harder to fake. And there is, depending on the industry, there is an equation there of how many employees it takes to manage a certain amount of clients, right? And so, so uh, are you saying you wouldn't listen to them unless they have a certain amount of? Employees? I listen to everyone. Everyone in the world can provide value, but I listen to them with a different lens. Oh, so oh, wait. so when John Maxwell calls me uh-huh. and says, JC. You need to meet this guy. I'm like, done. Where, where do I sign up? Because it's John Maxwell. John Maxwell. Right? When my wife tells me I need to meet someone, it's a different lens, but similar. My wife tells me someone, I'm, I'm there. Because she's not going to waste your time. But someone else does an intro. <laughs> Somebody okay, from cool. the grocery maybe, store. Maybe not. I don't know. But like, it's so important that we understand the lens of which to listen to someone from. Everyone has value. Everyone can help. Yeah. I mean, everyone. I get people way under me that under me by business terms, and they serve me in so many ways. But you have to understand the context of which you're getting the information from. And I think that's super key because, like, that's what me and Art were talking about. Where I'm like, you know what? We were talking about basically reviewing notes from our convo yesterday. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, he's definitely not wrong. And she literally said, shout out to you, by the way. She's going to say, or she did say, you know what? But I feel like JC can really speak on it because he's currently doing it. Not to say my mentors are not, but from the lens and perspective, the scale from which he's speaking from is way different. Yeah. Like my mentors don't have two hundred yeah. employees. Yeah. You know, one I think has around ten ish, the other yeah. one has maybe like two. It's just different. It's a different game. Different games, different things. So I think that's very key, especially as you continue to grow and scale and all the fancy words we like to use Mm -hmm. to realize everything has to be viewed with the Mm -hmm. right lens and perspective. And there's three like core lenses there. So one direct experience, one uh, indirect experience, and one ideas. So if I'm talking to someone, I'm like, so the question is, hey, how do you hire directors in your organization? Okay, so... Either one, I have hired directors with, with, with um, uh, quality directors with success. Mm-hmm. Two, I know someone who's hired directors with success, and I can tell you what happened there. Mm-hmm. Or three, I haven't done it, but I have an idea that could help you. All three of those you should be listening to with different lenses. Facts. Right? And so, uh, again, listen, ideas are great, beautiful, wonderful. But I would prioritize those that, like, I have done it. I have the experience. Yeah. I have 10 of them. And here's what I would do if I was, you know, in your shoes. It's very different advice than someone who's, I've never done that before, but, but you should do this. Yeah, because like me, I haven't hired a director. I was a supervisor, but that's not the same as a director. So that makes sense. It's a lot that's going on. All right, let's, let's wrap this up because we know you're important. So we did high school version. Biggest thing you learned in 2023 is not over, but what's the biggest thing you've learned this year so far? The biggest thing I've learned this year. This year, 2023 only. Because I know you've done some pretty epic stuff. One of the things that I've really, a couple of things that I've worked really hard on 
this year is uh, I had a mentor. I won't name any names. I have a guy. There's a guy that we brought in as a speaker that I like fell in love with. I mean, this guy was mm -hmm. hype energy that I was like, dude, this guy's incredible. Like, man, I want to do more with him. Maybe even hire him as a mentor. Maybe even like, you know, what all this good stuff. And and one of my other mentors, just like deep down, he's like, what What's the number one thing in your world? Like, what is like, like if you lose everything else, what can you not lose? And I'm like, yeah, my faith. You know, like my relationship with God. He's like, right. Does that guy have that? Mm -hmm. Like, no, not at all. He's like, he's not religious at all. In fact, he's got to like anti, not anti-religious, but he's just not comfortable even talking about it. Right. He's like, be careful who you're learning from. Right. Because when you're learning through the, the lens of a Christian, just everything's positioned in a different way. Everything's dealt with in a different that way. very true. Right? And so um, I was partnered with some folks that were not believers. Mm -hmm. In fact, a couple that had left the church. They were still good people. Right but they did life different. And what I have found is that I'm, I'm very intentional now with the relationships I have. Yes. I'm very, and I'm trying to be, uh, with the relationships I have, with the belief systems that we have, mm -hmm. with how we view family, yep. you know? Like, I, at this point, the business is my side hustle, to be frank. It's my side hustle. Like, my faith and my family are my primary job. And, and, and if someone else is, no, my primary job is height, like that's all I care about. Then we're gonna be. It's gonna be hard. That's because I'll get off at four. Because that's my primary. Right. right? And they'll be like, but we gotta stay to eight. Yeah, well, whatever. Right. And so it, it, it just it's just different. So like one thing is, I'm intentionally ending relationships with partners that are just not aligned on those type of things, um, and that's tough. It's really tough. Uh, number two, I've. Um, I, I'm a people pleaser. I like for people to be happy around me. I've lived in a, a world where I wasn't happy, and I was in a really dark place as a child, and a lot of fear and frustration and anxiety and anger at the world, and I hate it. I, I, it breaks my heart when people are not, like, end of the day happy. You know, like, like I'm cool with things happening and frustrations, but, like, and so... I take it personal in so many ways. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's been really, it's really tough, you know, in our organization when I hear and see people hurting or, or partners hurting or whatever the case may be. And so, um, so in the last year, I've really had to, how do I manage that at scale? Because with a team of 200 people, there's always someone hurting. Yeah, somebody's going to find a reason to be upset. Well, I mean, yeah, there's always someone struggling with a marriage. There's always someone. And so yeah. I had to really... Um, now I have these 20, you know, people that I'm kind of focused on in my organization. And, but, but before that, man, before that I was, I had, I was trying to focus on everyone, you know? And so like, I, I remember at one point I, where I really broke down was I, I had, I had five different team members that were needing help in their, their relationships, their marriages. And I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, I'm not, I'm not equipped for this. I don't, yeah, and, and it was not marriage helper. And it was a, it was a I mean, shout out to marriage helper. Uh, they're the people that can help it. And I can't. And there was a lot of pressure, and I found that, like, um, so how do, I, how do I still show I love people, but a little bit more from a distance? Mm -hmm. um, it's just really tough, really tough. So there's been a lot of lessons that are probably in a later podcast we can go through in a deeper standpoint, you know? And so, I'm but uh, um, business is hard, and every level's hard. It doesn't get easier as you grow. Which is what they tell you, by the way. Do. Oh, you know, when you start making a million or five, you know. Hire a CFO, and now it's easier. Hire a COO, and now it's, it just gets harder and harder and harder as you go. Um, you just want to develop the ability to manage that stuff as you, mm -hmm. as you grow and scale. So I'm getting stronger, hopefully. Hopefully at the same rate my organization is getting stronger. Um, Why shouldn't it be disproportionate? Well... If you disproport disproportionate the wrong way, it's get really bad. If my grow, if my, you know, in most companies, you know, Facebook grew so fast, Mark could not be the CEO anymore. They had to bring in someone with the, his his capacity was outgrown by the company's growth. Right? Yeah. And so, um, if I want to stay the CEO of the organization, I need to make sure that I'm growing at the same rate that it's growing. And mm -hmm. if I'm not, then the company will need and require another CEO. Right um, now, if I'm growing at a faster rate than his. Uh, than it, then then I want to figure out, you know, how can I grow it faster? Who can I bring on? And Favorite or funniest accounting or tax horror story? I'll be honest. Uh, 
so we don't do debt in the company. And, but my CFO convinced me that I should have a line of credit. And so I, I went and applied for a pretty large line of credit just to have on the safe side of like, you know, if something happens, it's like, it. it's like apply when times are good, you know? Yeah. And so I went to apply for it and, and uh, I came back and declined. I was like, what in the world? He's like, yeah, you have a tax lien. Or not a tax link. You have a tax. You you owe taxes from 2017. I owe 20 grand. I'm like what? Are from you kidding me? When? Some like how did I like? No one called me. No one emailed. So it turns out that something was written wrong on the deal, and then it showed that the numbers didn't match. So the IRS mailed me. And we were talking about this yesterday, but the, the IRS mailed me a, a notice of like you know, hey, what is this or something? You know, I don't know. And and but I had moved addresses, so I never got it. Because the IRS will never call or email, by the way. If they say that, that's a scam. They only communicate through mail. Continue. And so, like, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm applying for this loan for this. Because, again, we don't do it. Like, I guess if I would, you know, someone that was in lending and doing stuff, I would have probably found out sooner. But I didn't know. There's a lot of important things that this young man has to do. So we're going to wrap this up here. But before we do that, yeah. what we like to always give people the opportunity to do is this is the time to sell, sell, sell. So tell us, oh again, gosh. your name, no. business, who you serve, where can the people connect with you or find out more about you? Is there any current thing you're trying to push yeah. or promote? This is yeah. your time for that. And I'm just going to be yeah. your hype, man. Anything I want to promote. Okay, Anything. cool. All right. Uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about us, theheights.com, T-H-E-H-I-T-E-S, you can learn all about Karen and myself and, and what we have going on and I'll take this moment to push you, actually, because, yeah, 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 because I, I, I can serve in a lot of ways. But um, at the end of the day, like, how we manage finance, how we manage money is so crucially important. And, and it, it, it literally, you can do everything right. You can sell. You can do operations. You do everything right. But most of the world, and I'm saying most of the world, do not know how to manage their money. And having some outside perspective. And the cool thing about, I was in banking for 10 years. Bankers, finances, finance people, CFOs, they don't think dollar bills. Um, they don't think, how do I say this? When they see it, it's just numbers. They don't judge. Okay. And so, but they can bring that outside perspective in so many ways. And especially working with people like that are industry experts, they can actually go like, all the agencies we work with only spend 30% on systems and you're spending 50% on systems. What, are you doing? what can we do here? Right? So there's so much knowledge there. And so, so as someone that's very into the finances and the numbers and how we grow and scale, this has been an, a pivotal part of our, not only our growth, but our survival. Mm. You can grow forever yep. and then COVID hits and you're done. You can grow forever and then a recession hits and you're done. Totally. And so, so it's not just about the growth. You got to always be protecting your downside. You got to making sure you're saving the right, investing right, spending nice. right, um, all these good stuff. And that's going to happen from from a CFO. And so my encouragement would be that if you're not working with someone, call up Cameron, call up somebody, get the help you need to make sure that you can push forward, make sure your family's safe and secure, make sure that you're stable, make sure that you can survive and ideally thrive in tough times. There was a lot he dropped in this episode, so go back, listen to it, share it with people who you know are growing their agencies or even their company in general, because I think we can relate it to uh, general business yeah. advice. But I think the important things to note here as we wrap up is family's important. Make time for them. Be strict about those boundaries because you know that that's what you need to continue to help you to be the best person that you can be. Yeah. Surround yourself with people who are great and serve you in a way that is challenging and that will hold you accountable um, and that everything that glitters ain't gold. So I'm just saying, think about these things that he shared because we're not having somebody here that's talking from, as you mentioned, one of those three, just from theory. Like, I think this is the right thing to say or do or how to treat people. This is somebody who's done it as a high level and me being a beneficiary of that, like I know his team. And we literally even talked. I don't think you were there. We may have been at the beach. But literally, the team feels like family, not like, oh, yeah, we're just here because, you know, we're, we're getting our nice checks, you know, we're so valued. No, like, they enjoy being around each other. They enjoy – they have inside jokes about some of everything, and they still get work done. So build your team the right way. Build your family the right way. Build your support 
group or accountability group the right way. And you can get these great results. So did you said the heights.com. That's the only website you want to. Uh, okay, well, everything you need to know in your life regarding them, find it on theheist.com. This has been another episode of Legacy Journey. Guys, we're going to keep trying to find you great guests. I don't know if they're going to be able to top all of this, but we're going to try. So we will talk to you soon. Have a great day. Stay encouraged. Peace.